Now, natural disasters are brought about more at an emotional level than at a belief level, though beliefs have an important part to play, for they generate the emotions to begin with. The overall emotional tone or feeling tone of masses of people through their body connections with the environment bring about the exterior physical conditions that initiate such an onslaught of natural energy. According to the mass emotional conditions, various excesses are built up physically. These are then thrown off into the atmosphere in different form. The ghost chemicals mentioned earlier play a part here, and the electromagnetic properties of emotions. A rock in a stream will divide the water so that it must flow around the impediment. Your emotions are quite as real as rocks. Your collective feelings affect the flow of energy and their force, in terms of natural phenomena, can be seen quite clearly so in a thunderstorm, which is the exteriorized local materialization of the inner emotional state of the people experiencing the storm. As your conscious beliefs determine your bodily condition, and as your body is maintained at an unconscious level, though in line with your beliefs, so natural catastrophes are the result of the beliefs that give rise to emotional states, which are then automatically transformed into exterior atmospheric conditions. Then, According to your beliefs, you deal with the physical dilemma as it is presented in those terms. You will react individually with your own purposes in mind. Your own unique and highly private beliefs help bring about the overall emotional condition. The pool of emotional energy into which your emotions flow is still composed of unalike charges, but generally speaking, the individual contribution of all those participating will fall into a coherent pattern that gives impetus and direction to the storm, providing the charge and the power behind it. As mentioned earlier in this book, Rupert and Joseph were both involved in a flood situation, and so I will use that as a case in point, and this specific area in particular, although the flood itself was much more far-reaching. Locally, there were some general beliefs held. The Elmira region was economically depressed, and considered to be in a backwash area of the state of New York, yet the condition was not bad enough for crisis aid. Industry had been moving away. People were out of work. The old routines of livelihood had been uprooted. There was no inspiring local leadership, and a variety of different kinds of individuals felt ill at ease, depressed, and forced to the wall. Urban renewal projects ripped up the homes of the poor and destroyed older established neighborhoods. This often involved social divisions, for the impoverished were a mixture of blacks and quote-unquote lower-class whites. The better off sat at city councils, however, and the displaced poor were not able to afford the new structures. Through various manipulations, all underground, they were kept out of the quote-unquote better neighborhoods. The rich and well-to-do felt threatened, for they had changed the status quo by their insistence upon modernity and progress, thus releasing the energy of the needy. There was movement of the middle class from the city proper into the suburbs, with a change in the tax balance, and the city merchants began to suffer. The locality had no great sense of unity as a region, or overall pride in itself as a cultural or natural identity. There was some racial tension, hints of impending riots that did not occur. A very capable mayor who had been in office for some time was defeated. Politics entered in, for many reasons not necessary to this discussion. Politically oriented people felt they had no really strong hold, so that effective communication with the federal government could not be expected. In that area, a sense of powerlessness grew. Culturally, the region did not have its own identity, though it has always striven for some kind of characteristic expression. It saw government funds go past it to other sectors more economically depressed. The people had individual dreams and hopes, and in mass, these represented a regional vision of improvement at many levels. At the same time, feelings of discouragement grew. The young and the old, the conventional and the unconventional, had small skirmishes, where some of the city fathers objected to the long-haired youths in the city park. Quite trivial incidents, and yet indicative of splits of values and misunderstandings between the generations. To one extent or another, these same problems existed in all areas of the East Coast that were directly involved with that particular flood. Locally, you had a depressed region, not yet in the kind of crisis situation that would draw great federal funds, 
and highly unstable social and economic conditions coupled with a sense of hopelessness. Instead of a flood, disastrous social upheavals could have erupted. Because of the peculiar, unique, and characteristic feeling tones involved, however, the resulting emotional tensions were released, automatically transformed into the atmosphere. A natural catastrophe provided many answers. The river was close by, directly in the heart of the business section, for example. Again, all of this involved other areas affected by the flood. As certain primitives do rain dances and consciously bring about rain, deliberately directing unconscious forces, so the people in these different places did the same thing quite automatically, without awareness of the processes involved. They seeded the clouds, therefore, through unconscious intent, and through the spontaneous release of emotional states operating biologically, so that excess hormonal and chemical reactions directly affected the atmosphere. Sometime earlier, local religious organizations had made plans for a mass revival. Followers of a popular religious group were signed up, and some considerable publicity given for the event. Again, this was not accidental. It was an attempt on the part of the fundamental denominations to solve the problems at another level, through an influx of religious identification, conversion, and enthusiasm. The beliefs upon which these plans were based did not correlate, however, with the mass beliefs of the populace, and so the attempt failed. The program was based on precognitive knowledge of the flood event. The crusade never took place for the revivalist organization was frightened away by the flood. Many in the religious community said that the flood was the will of God at that level, or that people were being punished for their transgressions. In its own way, the flood was a religious event, for it united diverse groups of people who did not always have the most humanistic of intents with the community. In a strange way, it also served to isolate certain portions of the people and to highlight their predicament in a way that no riot could. It also humbled some, denying them the comfort of social position and belongings, at least momentarily, and brought them face to face with others of varying backgrounds with whom they would not have become acquainted otherwise. Crises such as this provide spotlighted views of reality, in which what was hidden is suddenly only too apparent. In many cases, the poor were saved, for most of the old homes and apartment houses survived while the newer ranch-style homes could not stand the onslaught of the water. Yet the college still found itself with many of the dispossessed needy at its doorstep. Women who had no stronger purpose than playing bridge ended up struggling for survival beside their more destitute sisters. Many of the poor who lost their living quarters discovered qualities of leadership in themselves that astonished them. The downtown area saw its inner, always known but hidden predicament, physically materialized. It was in a state of near ruin and needed drastic help. City government was suddenly confronted with a reality that had little to do with conference rooms. The crisis united the people. The feeling of hopelessness was out in the open for all to see, and therefore action could be taken. There were old people, laden with negative beliefs about age, who discovered great vitality and further purpose under the stimuli of survival. There were people blinded and lost by a belief in the supreme importance of things, who found themselves with nothing left. They realized the relative unimportance of belongings, and felt within themselves the stirring of a freedom they had not experienced since youth. The hidden, quote-unquote, illness of the area was plain for everyone to see. People came from all around to help. For once, comradeship ignored social structure. Taken for granted, patterns of existence had been ripped away quite effectively in a day's time. To one extent or another, each individual involved saw himself in clear personal relationship with the nature of his life thus far, and sensed his kinship with the community. More than this, however, each human being felt the enduring energy of nature, and was reminded, even in the seeming unpredictability of the flood, of the great permanent stability upon which normal life is based. The power of the water put each individual in touch with intimate recognition of his dependence upon nature, and made him question values taken for granted too long. Such a crisis automatically forces each person to examine values, to make instant choices that will provide him with recognitions to which he has been blind earlier. The flood, therefore, physically materialized the inner problems of the region, and at the same time released energies that had been trapped in hopelessness. 
the area became a psychic and physical focus point of attention, thereby attracting other energy to it. Each individual involved had his or her own reasons for participating, and through the mass-created framework, worked out private purposes and dilemmas. Many past beliefs were automatically shattered in the reality of the moment. Powers of initiation and action, long buried, were released in numberless individuals. Federal funds were directed instantly to this region. The spotlight was turned on to the section. Many lonely people were forced, or rather forced themselves, into a situation where it was imperative that they relate with others. Since this is not the main topic of this book, I cannot go deeply into the ways and means involved. As a case in point, however, we will deal with Rupert's and Joseph's experience with the flood situation, for their participation will have application to many others.